There's got to be more to the church than a pep rally on Sundays. We are living in critical, critical times. In our world, we are to confront the culture, not conform to it. This is not a racial problem. This is not a political problem. This is not a socioeconomic problem. This is a gap problem. That is what our job is today. Stand in the gap and make up the difference. Be a viable force in our community. So I sought for man or woman or teenage kid or just anybody. Anybody among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land. I should not destroy it. But I found no one. Amen. Amen. Are we Gap people? Yes. Praise God. Thank you for being here this morning. We're entering into a new, a new series, and we just pray that God will challenge us through this word over the next few weeks. Um, my heart was challenged last Sunday. What a powerful anointing of God that was in the house, and we, we thank Him for that. We're, I want to say personally and publicly that I'm glad to have my mother in service with us today, Dolores, and she seldom is here. And so, Mom, would you wave? That's, this is my mom. And she has heard that I preach 30 minutes or less, and I told her, I said, Mom, I don't know who's been lying to you. <laughs> so I'll try to behave my, be on my best behavior today. But uh, we are delighted to have Mom here with us. <clears throat> I've said this, and, I'm, and I so appreciate uh, Mom is one of the godliest women that I've ever known and raised me um, knowing the Lord and with an intimate relationship with Him. I appreciate Mom's heart for God. She's still passionate about the Lord, and she still preaches at me all the time. (laughs) And that's okay. That's okay. You never cease to be a parent. That's right. And so, uh, praise God. If you have your Bibles, take them and turn to Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1, and we'll be arriving there in a few moments. Hello, Dave Heverin. Good to have you this morning. All of his notes in the aisle there. That's impressive. Those are all notes he took in my preaching. I am so grateful. (laughs) Praise the Lord. The subject that we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks is simply this. When people stand strong in the gap, what happens? What's the result of that? What's the result if we do not? So we're going to be discussing a list of individuals who dared to stay in the gap and just make a difference in their world, in their situation, in their society. As we shared last Sunday, a gap by definition represents a place of weakness, vulnerability, and danger. It is a defenseless location of exposure and limitation, a point where people face real threats. I tell you, friends, in our country, in our society, in our community, on your block, in your neighborhood, in your classroom, there are gaps that exist. Gaps in our country, our communities, our churches, in our homes, in our family, gaps of racial prejudice, gaps of social injustice, of moral decay, of sexual promiscuity, of gaps of destructive addiction and family implosion and marital demise and destruction all around us. And we as a church are not insulated to the effects of these gaps in our society, a society that is in a place of weakness and vulnerable and and facing danger to just survive, much less thrive. Gaps that affect our hearts and our home and our houses of worship. And when the enemy attacks these gaps in our lives, we feel hopelessly overwhelmed unless there is a divine intervention by God in our behalf. But how many knows that he is that 
that defender, and he is that protection, and he is all we need to live in health and hope and promise. He wants to be that kind of God in your life. And I know that there are some of you that, that you're, you're going through some real hell in your situation. I just want to point you again in the direction of heaven because Jesus is still the hope in the midst of all of your struggle. He's still the answer. He still has an answer. God is not wringing his hand trying to figure out what to do next, but God has a plan and God has a purpose for your life. So may we just lean on him and put our trust in him. If we've got to wake up every morning saying, God, I don't know how I'm going to get through this day, but I'm daring to believe that you are more than enough. I believe God will always come through for us because he's true to his word. Today, I believe God wants to address some of those gaps in our lives. And I believe probably that all of us have areas that need shoring up or strengthening. I believe God wants to stir and challenge each of us to stand in the gap before him for the land. Maybe for our neighborhood, for our home, for our family, for our marriage, for our job, for our future. God wants us to stand in the gap before him for the land that there's the blessing and favor of God, not the curse of those things round about us. So I want us to focus this morning on Nehemiah. He was a gap person. Interestingly enough, he was not a preacher. He was not credentialed. He was just an ordinary guy. He was just probably at one time a blue-collar worker that had worked up the ranks, and he was there by the king's side. And yet God used this man to impact a nation. It's not about your position. It's not about the card you carry in your wallet. It's not about all the knowledge that you have in your head. It's about your heart to respond to God's heart. Amen. And you become his hands extended. And you become his heart beating in this world. God wants to use each and every one of us to make a difference in the land in which we live. Let me give you a little history for the next couple of minutes. The setting is about 500 years before the time of Christ. God's people had lived in Israel for centuries. God had told them, if you obey me, you will live in this land forever. My blessings will continue to flow, but if you disobey me, you'll be carried off into captivity. And that's exactly what happened. The Babylonians came and conquered God's people and enslaved them, taking them a thousand years miles away from their homeland. And here, Jerusalem, their beloved city, lay in shambles and in ruin. A society, a people that had been displaced and disgraced. The Babylonians defeated Judah in 586 B.C. They destroyed, they destroyed the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. They stole the golden vessels from the altar and took most of the captured people back to Babylon. It was a forced march. There are ancient images of men and women being dragged along dusty roads with fish hooks in their noses. The physical and emotional pain was excruciating, but the destruction of the temple broke their hearts for centuries. God, people had worshipped there in the presence of God. His Shekinah glory dwelled in the Holy of Holies in the innermost part of the temple. Miracles happened every day. How many believe that miracles should still happen every day? Why? Because we serve a everyday God that changes not. Miracles happen every day. No matter which way the wind blew, the smoke from the sacrifices always went straight up to heaven. In the fields, God gave them a bumper crop in the sixth year so they could take the next year off, a sabbatical year. How many would like for God to reinstate that? (laughs) And God bless you the six-year double so you can just take a vacation, a year vacation, the seventh year. Can I get a witness, anybody? (laughs) Now, all that was gone. Jerusalem was destroyed 
The temple was torn down and looted, and about 50,000 inhabitants stumbled into exile in Babylon, including Ezekiel. After many years, God's people began to return to their homeland. Zerubbabel and Ezra led the first group of those exiled back to Israel. And under the command of God and appointment of God, they restored the altar, the sacrifices, and began to worship God. About 20 years after they arrived, a new temple was built and dedicated. Oh, it looked nothing like Solomon's temple. Didn't have the flash, the gold. It was not the edifice that Israel had enjoyed for years. But it's interesting to me in Haggai chapter 2 and verse 7, God promised, I will fill this temple with glory. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. I believe that God wants to establish that same promise to us today. That the glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former. That in the last days before the coming of Christ, that there is going to be such an outpouring of God's presence and power that it's going to... Those things that happened in the past are going to pale in comparison to what God is doing. I don't believe the church is just going to slip out of town after dark. I believe Christ is coming back for a glorious church that still has a testimony upon their lips. And God is at work. And God is bearing his mighty arm in behalf of his people declaring, I am still God and I am still in control. I believe there's a revival that's coming forth that we should enjoy and be a part of in these last days before the coming of God. Yes. How many believe that? Yes. I mean, I'm not looking for an escape. I'm looking for the revival of God to generate such a lift and a thrust that it just, it just shoots us off the ground. Hallelujah. Praise God. Kind of like that zip line I was on yesterday. <laughs> kind of, sort of. Not exactly. In Ezra 6.15 the Bible says, now the temple was finished on the third day of the month of Adar. And it goes on to say in these scriptures, and the children of Israel, the priests and the Levites and the rest of the descendants of the captivity, they celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. They offered sacrifices. They dedicated. They reinstated the temple practices. It was a joyous day in the house of God. I'm telling you, friend, there is nothing that brings any more joy into the house of God like the presence of God. It's not the preaching, it's not the music, it's not the organizational skills, it's not the programs or promotional, it is the, it is the raw presence of God that, that excites the soul and heals and soothes the broken. We need that presence again. We need that latter glory to fall upon us. We need God to open the heavens and pour out a blessing of himself upon us. Amen. Nothing can change a heart like the presence of God. The Bible says the sacred had returned to Jerusalem. The holy had come home. God had returned. And yet God wasn't finished yet. For during this period, the Persians conquered Babylon. Nehemiah was a Jewish man who had remained in Persia. An exiled man, his family, his descendants, they remained in Persia. His story begins 141 years after the fall of Jerusalem. He rose to a place of honor as the cupbearer to King Artaxas. That's not exactly the way you... I just, you know, taxes brings out the worst in me. <laughs> that brings us to our text this morning, Nehemiah chapter 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Helkaliah, it came to pass in the month of... Sh Shislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came for the men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews, I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. And so it was when I heard these words 
that I sat down and wept, and I mourned for many days, and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great, awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night. I pray for the children of Israel, your servants, And confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, Though some of you are cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I've chosen as a dwelling for my name. These are your servants and your people whom you've redeemed by your great power, by your strong hand. Oh, Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day. I pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was, for I was the king's cupbearer. And Nehemiah cried out, How's Jerusalem? How's my home? And the answer, the survivors who are left from the captivity, they're in great distress and reproach. The walls of Jerusalem are broken down and the gates are burned with fire. Nehemiah, we have a huge gap problem in Jerusalem. The temple, I want you to hear this, the temple, though rebuilt, the house of God reinstated The sacred, the holy, is now unprotected, unshielded, and unguarded because the walls are broken down. There is no protection. There is no shield against the attacks of the enemy. Understand, the temple was the place where heaven kissed earth, the place where God dwelled in his awesome presence, where the glory cloud hovered over the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. And yet the wall protecting these sacred things lay in rubble and ruin. And they needed someone to come and stand the gap, make up the hedge before God for the land so they could protect and shield and guard the sacred. May we be reminded this morning, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Today, we are the place where heaven kisses earth, and we need walls of protection to defend and guard God's glory that's within us. The sacred is our hearts and our home and our house of worship. So my question this morning for all of us, how is our Jerusalem? How is our home? How is our heart? How is our house of worship? Is it healthy or is it an easy target for the enemy? Let me give you just a couple things that I believe get people embrace and live at, live, live up to. And we see that the first reaction of, of Nehemiah is found in Nehemiah chapter 1-4. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and I wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Nehemiah not only admitted there was a problem, Nehemiah addressed the problem on his knees. We never stand so tall as when we are kneeling before God. Nehemiah stood in the gap on his knees. With his heart broken, his eyes red and swollen, his lips moving in silent intersection. So the first step in closing the gap of those things that would steal the sacred, steal the holy, steal the presence of God out of your life, steal the joy, steal the peace, steal God's purpose in your life. The first step in closing that gap and saying, no way, devil, are you going to take what God has promised me is we begin to pray. We combat the attacks of the enemy on our knees. Now, usually what we do is we do everything else imaginable, and then we pray. 
And God says, pray first. Come to me first. Bow before me first. And then I will lead you to what you must do beyond your prayer. We stand in the gap by bending our knees in fervent and effectual prayer and repentance. We fall on our face before God and we pray to him. Say, God, please help us. Your prayer, I want you to hear this, your prayer is a hedge of protection. It's the supernatural shield, the difference maker in guarding the glory in your heart, your home, and the house of God. There's nothing that brings security to you like your prayers before God. And that is the reason, listen to me, that is the reason why much of our church is weak and anorexic and has no muscle strength at all because by and large across the nation and our churches, we are prayerless people. And if we don't somehow say a revival of prayer, where our hearts are given to prayer, we allow the Spirit to woo us into a closet of prayer and begin to realize the power and the anointing and the release of God through our prayers, then we will continue to live without miracle, frustrated, trying to live the life that we know we should. It's the prayers before God that strengthen your faith, that give you the divine energy that you need to live above reproach and do the things that God has called you to do. As we are people of prayer. So how often do you pray? How often do you hit your knees? And when you do, how long do you stay? We have prep time before every service on, during the week. We have hardly anybody that comes. And yet the answer, the answer to a growing church, an anointed church, and a church of miracles, where prodigals still come home to the Father's house, and diseases are still rebuked. Come on now. Souls are saved, lives are changed, storms are stilled, we grow in God. It's still a result, friends, of people of prayer. It's the outgrowth of our time on our knees as we prep ourselves for the presence of God, as we position ourselves so God can move in our behalf. We all know it. And I believe when we stand before God someday that our hearts will be broken a bit because we finally realize and understand what we missed in life because we were not people of prayer. Kids, I want to tell you, I love you, but you are living in a society that's different than was there when I was a kid. And you're facing pressures that I never had to face. Temptations that, 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 that were never as aggressive and so in your face and so blatant. And I love you kids. But I'm going to tell you the only way you're going to survive this society and stay clean and keep your head about yourself yes. and step into God's divine purpose. You, you've got to have a prayer life. You've got to know where your knees are at. You've got to know God in that secret place with Him. You've got to feel His presence, not just on Sunday, but on Monday morning as you're getting ready for school and all you guys are putting your makeup on. You've got to know that God's there. Just kidding. And here's the deal. We owe it to our kids. We owe it to our children and our grandchildren to live by example that they, they know what it is to hear us pray. They see the tears stream down our face. They know that mom and dad have their back in prayer because we are a living example of people of prayer that we stand or we kneel in the gap every day for the sake of our families, our heart, our home, and the house of God. Amen. Amen. People of prayer. I believe somehow Nehemiah understood 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then I will hear from heaven. Then I will forgive their sin. Then I will heal their land. 
And as we are people of prayer, God says, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. You want God to move into your place? Come on now. Open your door in prayer. Isaiah 58, 9, Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, Here I am. Jeremiah 29, 13, And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Nehemiah understood God was, was his only help, his only hope, and it came to the avenue of prayer. And Nehemiah bowed his head and prayed for those that were captive in Jerusalem. The second thing, and I just, I'm going to just get through this this morning best that I can. I just, there's so much here that I want to share with you, but the ste- second step in closing the gap and protecting the sacred is the, to petition. In Nehemiah chapter 2, the next chapter, in verse 1, and it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of the king, when, when wine was before him, that I took wine and gave it to the king. Now I, now I have been sad in his presence before. Therefore the king said to me, or I've never been sad in his presence before. Now the king said to me, why is your face sad and since, since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad? When the city, the place of my father's tomb, lie waste and its gates are burned with fire. Then the king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heavens and I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask you, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tomb, that I may, what, rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, she was probably punching him, saying, let him go. How long will your journey be, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. The second step in closing the gap is simply that. We petition the throne. We petition the throne. We're praying, but we bring a petition before the throne. I think it's okay for us to pray very focused. To be very focused in our prayers. Not just general prayers that if by chance God answers, you're not for sure if it was God or not, or just circum, but to pray focused prayers. I need to do this. I need to go. This is what needs to happen. And as you read the scripture, you'll see that it was all laid out before the king. Nehemiah was willing to petition the throne, to cry out to the king. And the results were simply, Nehemiah had the nod of the king to rebuild the walls, close the gap, and provided him with provision and protection to do so. Hear my heart this morning. We as well have the nod of a king. But not just any king. We have the uncompromising and unconditional nod of the king of kings and the lord of lords who is passionate about us closing the gap and rebuilding the walls of our lives, that we live with the sacred and the holy and the glory and the power and the presence and the joy and the peace of Almighty God. He's just looking for someone who will stand up and declare, enough is enough, it's time to go into the enemy's camp and take back what he has stolen from me. I ask you the question this morning, what has, sto- what has Satan stolen from you? What has he taken from What sacred thing has he robbed you of this morning? It's not right. It's not right we just walk away and say, well, you know, it just happened. I think it's, there's times we just got we to draw a line in the sand and dig our heels in the ground and say, this is not right. This is not God's will. And begin to pray against the darkness and declare lightness and, 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 and lift our hearts with a petition to God and say, God, we need you to come invest yourself in this situation because according to the word of God, this is not the direction this situation should be heading. I believe it's very critical that when we begin to pray and we're dealing with we're dealing with the supernatural and it's it's an issue of the sacred, the, the will of God, the plan of God in our lives, for our lives, for our marriages, for our home, for our church, that we need to pray with specific things in mind as God leads us, as we, as we lift this petition to God. We say, God, this and this and this and this, this is what your word declared, and this is what your spirit has led me to pray. And then believe that God is going to move 
in this very focused way. How many believe God can still do that? Amen. How many knows the spirit of deception is no big challenge to God? So Nehemiah, Nehemiah makes this long, exhausting journey to his homeland. I'm wrapping this up. With the blessing of the king and all the provision and permission he needs to accomplish the impossible. And there he finds a remnant that still believes that things can be different. That hurts can be healed. The brokenness can be mended. The walls can be repaired. In Nehemiah 2.17, then I said to them, Nehemiah said to them, you see the distress that we're in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may, lo may, no, may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also the king's word that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. The third step to closing the gap is participation. In other words, you're a part of rebuilding the walls and closing the gap. Hear my heart. Your sacred will never survive without some blisters on your spiritual hands. Listen to me. You've got to work at having a good marriage. Ask my wife. You've got to work at it. You've got to work at it to have a happy home. You've got to work at it to have an anointed church. It's not just hire the right preacher. We've got to work at it. We've got to work at it to keep the sacred sacred and the holy holy and the presence of God paramount. We've got to work at it. We've got to be a part of the miracle, praying, petitioning, saying, God, whatever you need for me to do, I'm willing for it. I have a mind to work. I will rise up. I will rise up, and I will work for the cause of the kingdom. In other words, you've got to work at it to realize it, just as you've got to want it to walk in it. And they said, let us rise up and build, and they set their hands to this good work. But it so happened, and Sat Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, and he was furious and very indignant. And mocked. You just need to read through the story. It's amazing. He began to mock the Jews, and he spoke before his brethren, the army of Samaria, and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? What are these... Christians trying to do? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of the rubbish stones that are burned? Now, Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and said, whatever they build, if even a fault goes upon it, he will break down their stone wall. The fourth and final step of closing that gap and rebuilding the walls, you've got to have some perseverance. This one thing, your sacred, your heart, your home, your house of worship will never go uncontested, unchallenged by the enemy. If you try to take a step forward, hear me, you're going to run head on into Satan because he will not, he will not just let it lie. Satan will challenge us every step of our spiritual progress. I mean, consider the names of those that were challenging Nehemiah. Sanballat, his name literally translated, may sin come to life. In other words, spiritual compromise. In other words, settle for less than God's best. Just quit pressing. Just be satisfied with what you've got. Be thankful that it's as good as it is. How many knows that's not the voice of God? Sin ballot. His name. May sin come to life. You can just survive. You don't have to thrive. Just, just live on the bare essentials. Another individual that challenged them later, Geshem, which his name literally translated means storm, a spiritual unheaval or chaos, a divine destiny trying to be distracted, an energy drain. And what was Nehemiah's response to Geshem and Sanballat? Hear, O our God, for we are despised, but turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had what? The people had what? They had a mind to work. They had a mind to do something for God. In Nehemiah 6.15, and I wrap it up with this, so the wall was finished 
on the 25th day of Elul, in 52 days. And it happened, all of our enemies heard. And, and here, let me just throw this out, an interesting thing. For Zerubbabel and Ezra and those guys, all these priests and preachers, it took them years, several years, to, to rebuild the temple. It only took the laity, the congregation, 52 days to build the walls. Do you see why we need you? It takes us forever. But if we can just get, can we just get the churches involved, there's no telling what we can do for the cause of the kingdom. So the wall was finished in 52 days, and it happened when all of our enemies heard it and all the nations around us saw these things. They were very disheartened. It took the wind out of their sails in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was done by God. With God's help and their willingness to work, they closed the gap, they rebuilt the wall, and the sacred things were protected once more. I believe it's time in this generation, this society, we were that we rise up to protect those things that are sacred and holy. Our hearts, our relationship with God, our homes, our marriages, our families. Our, our families and homes, are, they've been torn apart by this society and generation. We need God to once again mend, mend that wall where well, the wall's been breached. We need God to help us to rebuild relationships in the house of God. We need the house of God to be the house of God. We need more testimonies like we heard this morning. How many believe there's more testimonies to be had? So I just challenge you over the next few weeks to let God just do something in your life that stirs something, stirs something up within you that just, you know, I refuse, I refuse to live on less than God's best. I'm, I'm seeking greater instead of settling for good. I'm believing for a great revival instead of just church as usual. So I ask you again, I ask you again, how is your heart this morning? How is your heart? I mean, do you love him? Is it intense? Is it passionate? Is there, is there drive within you? Is there a, a spiritual motor that's, that's humming inside of you because of your relationship with Jesus? Or is it, just, is it just a shell of what it used to be? Have you lost the fire? Have you lost the zeal? Have you lost the passion for God? We can sit in our pews Sunday after Sunday and know the songs and know when to say amen and when to keep quiet and yet be dead inside. God wants us alive. God wants us energized by His Spirit. Some of you haven't shouted in a long time. Some of you, you've not shed a tear in a long time. Some of you haven't spoken in, in tongues in a long time. And God wants to restore the joy of His salvation in your life. God wants to open the heavens above you and just lavish Himself upon you. You live in freedom. Amen. You wake up in the morning with joy in your heart and a spring in your step, sparkle in your eye because God is so good and so real and so close. I don't believe that's the kind of life God wants you to have. It's the kind of heart that God wants to possess. How's your home? How's your home? Scale to one to ten. One being ten being great. How's your home? Is there harmony there? Is there peace there? Is it a safe place? Is it a refuge? Do you feel God there? Are there songs of worship and praise? How's your home? How's within the walls, the quarters of your house, your home? How's your family doing? Do you hug more than you hurt? Do you encourage more than you discourage? How's your home? Parents, how's your relationship with your kids? Do they want to be like you? Do they want to grow up to be like mom or dad? Or are you way down on the list of people they want to emulate? How's your home? How's your house of worship? How is this house? I want us to protect the sacred.
We've got to protect the sacred, the holy, the presence of God, the glory of God. That's our only hope for survival. It's not the knowledge we can amass and attain. It's the glory of God that, that we can carry with us. Carriers of the Spirit, carriers of God. We are, we are vessels of honor. We are channels that God flows through continually. We're living, breathing testimonies of the goodness and the greatness of God. We lay hands on the sick and they recover. We're light in the darkness and salt in, the, in an unsavory place. That's the kind of people God wants us. Gap people. We can rebuild the walls. And some of, you this need, some of you this morning need to say, you know, where I'm at is unacceptable. It's unacceptable based on the Word of God, the promises of God. And you need to, you need to stop just surviving and just barely getting by spiritually. You need to ramp it up. Begin to pray and petition and participate. Continue to persevere and just see what God will do in your life, in your heart, in your home, in your house of worship. Amen? Head bowed and eyes, eyes closed, please. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. Thank you for your spirit, God. Thank you, Lord, that they, they were able to rebuild the walls to protect the temple, to protect the house of God, to protect the sacred, to protect the holy. And God, we have gaps in our walls. God, give us the same passion, desire, and commitment to rebuilding our walls filling the gaps, protecting the sacred, the holy of our heart, our home, and our houses of worship, oh God. God, challenge us through your word, I pray. Challenge us through your word. So the heads bowed and eyes closed across this congregation today. Very simply, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. I'm going to pray with you and for you right where, you, right where you're at. But this morning, if the walls around your heart, the walls around your relationship with God is broken down, there's gaps, you're under attack, your heart, your intimacy with God is under attack. It's been a long time since you've sensed the presence of God. Your faith has been tried. I mean, you've come under attack or we, you've, just, you've just been absent from seeking God. You've just been AWOL so to speak, spiritually. Either way, you need God to somehow help you to rebuild those walls and to fill those gaps concerning your heart. If that's you, I want you to stand.